Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you feel a little weak today, let's just have to think about the joy of the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy.
lift your name up this morning. You are a holy God. You are worthy of our worship. You're King of kings and Lord of lords, God. Thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together in your presence and to know that when two or three are gathered together that you are with us. And so, Lord, we do sense your presence this morning. We want to hear you speak. God, I know that you will speak through your word, and I pray that we will be willing to adjust uh, our thinking uh, to your ways, to your plans, to your purposes. God, I pray that we'll be full of your Holy Spirit and that we will experience your unconditional love. God, that we will sense your peace and that we will have joy, Lord, beyond our circumstances. Help us to keep our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We love you because you first loved us. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you. you may be seated.
Isn't it wonderful to be a believer? Isn't it wonderful to be a follower of Jesus? And to have the sweet, sweet fellowship that we have with our church family. I love you guys so much. And I just love the things that you are doing for the Lord. Thank you. Keep it up and uh, look for those opportunities. You know, the Bible says we're to buy up opportunities. And I hope that you're buying everyone up because uh, when we do, we are so blessed. Thank you for your generosity on the Mary Hill Davis uh, offering. Uh, we went over our goal, and so uh, we are so thankful and knowing that we get to participate in spreading the gospel all over Texas. So thank you so very much for that. Thank you also for volunteering during Yamboree. Uh, it's a wonderful ministry this church has been doing for many, many years. Thank you for feeding the carnival workers. You just can't imagine how much they appreciate it. It's the only place they go to get that where they are treated this way. No other community, you know, they, they do this work. It's I guess it's seasonal, but about year-round. And uh, they always say this is the only place where they get it. So thank you. Th thank you for showing the love of Jesus. It'll be a uh, tremendous opportunity. Thank you for candy that I saw coming through the uh, door today so that we can be prepared for our fall uh, festival. Uh, you are an awesome, awesome group of people. If you're a guest today, welcome to the greatest church on the planet. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, to look in the worship guide. There's a section there that we would love to ask you to fill out. We'd love to have your mailing address or email address so that we can let you know about uh, future events. You can trade that card at the end of the service for a free gift that we have from you. You can also find out more about our church by texting 903-296-3135. Let's stand and greet each other and greet our guests. Let's do that right now. sing with us. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and the darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his
praise him for his amazing grace, his amazing love. Psalm 51, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing love? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you holy, trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood? just a second I want to share something that's on my heart brother Mike you may never let me have the microphone again but I'm Gene if you don't know me I'm with Texas Baptist men we just got back from Morgan City Louisiana yesterday and next Sunday I won't be here because we're headed to Tennessee you see it on TV folks are in a bad way and they need some help many of you and your generosity have given gift cards for us to give to those folks and I want you to know every time we give them a gift card, before that, we give them a Bible. We talk to them about the plan of salvation. We give them an opportunity to go to heaven with us. If they have little kids, electricity's out, they've lost everything in the refrigerator. A lot of them have lost everything. Gives them help, hope, and healing. And it's, it's very humbling to be part of that. But by giving, you're part of that too, because not everybody can go. And I just know that you'll be blessed for helping. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything we have, Lord. Thank you for this church. Everybody has, I can speak that all of us will 
slow down and look at somebody that we know that's on our heart. Give them a hug. Tell them that Jesus knows their name and he loves them. Lord, I just pray that you'll take this offering and these tithes and apply it to your kingdom in a way that will help you the most, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll speak through Brother Mike straight to our hearts, the message today. Lord, we love you and pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. And all this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. It will sound and we will arise when heaven calls and this life is over. We stand before our God and Savior. When heaven calls, we must be ready. walking with Jesus through eternity. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. We have mission work to do while we are here 
and this place is in disaster, not just natural disaster, but we're in spiritual disaster, and uh, there's going to come a time when Jesus is going to rescue us out of here. And uh, that is going to be called the rapture. Now, you will probably notice that I am uh, taking a pre-tribulation or pre-millennial approach to our discussion about um, eternity. And uh, the, the more I study it, the more I lean that direction. But you can still be one of the other two. Or you can definitely be, you know, the, the group that says, uh, I'm a pan millennialist. It's just going to all pan out in the end. Now, we can all be right about that. But at any rate, if you're in the premillennial camp, then there are two events. There's the rapture and there's the second coming. Okay, when the rapture happens, amazing things will happen. Those living after Christ's resurrection who have believed in Jesus, i.e. the church, will be in heaven. At that time, as we discussed last week, we'll be involved in the judgment seat of Christ where believers will receive crowns for the good deeds that they did on the earth and then those good deeds that we did with a wrong motive will end up being burned up uh, literally, and then we will also celebrate the marriage of the Lamb, where the church and Jesus will be put together for eternity. Meanwhile, back on the earth, incredible events will be taking place as well. After the rapture, the world will go into intense suffering called the tribulation. For seven years, Satan, with the Antichrist, will reign. He will lead all of mankind. And the all of mankind will be completely rebellious against God. And God will pour out his judgments on mankind. At the end of the tribulation, life will be totally unbearable on the earth. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be in control of the world. While it will appear that the Antichrist is in charge, God will quickly bring history as we know it to a close. And then after the tribulation, during the great battle of Armageddon, Jesus will return to the earth, the second coming of Jesus. He will destroy the works of Satan and he will rule on the earth for 1,000 years. So the first thing that I want you to consider this morning is at the second coming, Jesus Christ will return as a mighty warrior this time. He won't be like he came the first time, a baby in the manger. He will be a mighty warrior to defeat his enemy. History will never be the same again once Jesus comes back to judge the world at the second coming. He came the first time to offer our salvation. He will come the second time and he will bring judgment. He will come in a very dramatic way. Look with me, Matthew 24, verse 27. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I mean, what a moment this is going to be. The world is going to be totally dark. Stars are going to be falling from the sky. God's brilliant glory will flash across the sky like lightning. Most people on the earth will be in rebellion 
against God and they will look up with dread and they will see the one that they hate so much who will be coming in great brilliance and power. It says in Revelations 19, 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Jesus Christ will come with the armies of heaven. Now, who are the armies of heaven? That will be you and me. We will be the believers who will also be on white horses. We will return with Christ and we will rule with him 1,000 years on the earth. He will judge the world and rule forever. The world will be in mourning because they will realize that they are being defeated by Jesus Christ. Jesus will defeat the armies of the world who are in battle at Armageddon. At Armageddon, they'll be fighting against each other, which, by the way, you need to be alert on what's happening on the world stage when Iran is attacking Israel. That's very biblical, very scriptural. It's a sign of the times and a sign that the rapture could be imminent, okay? When you see things like that going on, pay attention. The time is, is drawing near. Well, there's going to be this great battle, the battle of Armageddon, and nations will be fighting against each other. But when Jesus comes again on his white horse and tens of millions of believers come with him on our white horses, all of a sudden they're going to stop fighting against each other and their focus is going to be on Jesus and all those that are coming. Can you just imagine what this is going to be like? It talks about what's going to happen in Revelations 19, verse 11 and following. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Jesus Christ will come this time to make war. His eyes will be blazing with fire. He'll be riding a white horse. There will be many crowns on his head. And he will be wearing a special robe. And as I said before, tens of millions of believers will be riding white horses as well. People of every walk of life will meet their doom at the hands of Jesus. It's just bizarre to us, isn't it? Because he's offered us so much love and grace. See, the Holy Spirit is holding back the wrath of God because we're living in the church age. But the Holy Spirit will no longer at this moment hold back the wrath of God. These people will have no chance against the mighty warrior, Jesus Christ. He will defeat the Antichrist. He will defeat the false prophet. The, the Antichrist will be the most evil and godless man who has ever lived. He will be empowered by Satan. He will set himself as God. His desire will be to be worshipped by the people. The false prophet will assist him. And together, the, all those who worship Jesus, excuse me, worship the Antichrist, will receive the mark of the beast, which is the number 666. They will hate 
Jesus Christ, will, but will be powerless to stop him. Uh, Revelations 19, verse 19 and through 21. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs of, on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them will be thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Jesus will come with brilliant power and the Antichrist and the false Christ will be destroyed, I mean, the false prophet will be destroyed by the splendor of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Do you see the power that will be displayed? And it says that they will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is hell. And then Satan will be locked away for 1,000 years. Satan, the source of all deceit, the source of all temptation and sin, at the second coming, he will be rendered useless and he will be locked away. It says in Revelation 20, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. What's the abyss? The abyss is the headquarters of Satan and his demons. He and his demons will be under house arrest. Satan's lies, his deceit, had been destroying mankind. And if it wasn't for the goodness of God, his deceiving ways would have led everyone into ruin. And then the second thing that I want you to think about is that Jesus is going to be setting up his kingdom on the earth. And he will reign on the earth for a thousand years. It's called the millennium. It's a Latin word which means a thousand. Jesus Christ will rule on this earth. He will bring perfect justice. He will bring complete peace to all mankind. Jesus will bring purity to the world. He will bring prosperity and health. And the world that had just been torn apart by Satan and the false prophet, the destruction of war and the economy will be in just in terrible shape. Christ will then rule from Jerusalem he will be the greatest ruler the world has ever seen. And he will bring about world peace and justice and righteousness. The prophet Isaiah prophesied this day. He said in Isaiah 2, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains, it will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come us, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, will settle disputes for many peoples, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. God has always loved the city Jerusalem. It is from there that he ruled the people of God through kings. And there he also spoke through prophets about his plan for salvation and for eternity. It was in Jerusalem at the holy temple where the people of God would go and offer up sacrifices to the Lord in worship for their sin. It was in Jerusalem where Jesus Christ was convicted and he was crucified. It was in Jerusalem where God will set up his kingdom and he will rule through Jesus for a thousand years. No wars, no violence. Jesus Christ will settle all disputes. Even when predicting the birth of Jesus, Isaiah the prophet prophesied that one day Christ will lead the greatest government of all time. Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Oh, the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The presence of God will be felt everywhere. You ever gone somewhere and all you feel is evil? I have. There will be no such place. Everywhere you go, you will feel the Spirit of God. You remember that mountaintop experience you had on a retreat, at camp, a special worship service? During the millennium, the closeness of Christ and the thrill of being with other believers will be felt worldwide. The prophet Jeremiah said this, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor to say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more says God will write his law in their minds, on their hearts, for all those who are a part of the kingdom. The Holy Spirit will have an awesome and powerful influence. Can you imagine it? On every human being. Joel 2, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. There will be absolutely no opposition because Satan and his demons will not be around. They will be bound. There will only be unconditional love. There will only be joy. There will only be peace. And mankind will experience health and wealth. The prosperity gospel will arrive. Prosperity will be destroyed. And the whole world will prosper. Amos 9.13 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. 
New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. Those who are living during the millennium will not be able to keep up with all the abundance that God will give them. Can you imagine? You will never ever worry about paying another bill again. Won't that be wonderful? No hospitals in the millennium. No nursing homes. Health and long life will be the norm. It sounds like I'm going to be without a job. <laughs> Isaiah 33, 24. No one living in Zion will say, I am ill, and the sins of those who dwell there will be forgiven. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leak like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Isaiah 65, 20. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child and the one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. It will be the most incredible time that you and I, I mean, it's, it's just beyond what we could even imagine or think. And it will start at the world's worst time in history, at the end of the tribulation. Okay, there's some scholars that think it might be the middle of whatever. Jesus Christ will come again. He will destroy the work of Satan. And Satan will be locked away for a thousand years. And there will be a thousand years of love and joy and peace and prosperity and health. Can't wait, can you? Come on, Lord, come quickly. Isaiah 11, verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. Can you imagine a world like that? It's going to boggle the mind, isn't it? It's going to be absolutely tremendous. So, let go of that stress. Relax. God's got it all figured out. Just be his missionary. Join him in what he's doing in his world. Let him empower you. Let him take care of everything else. Keep your eyes on him. Run the race of life. And he'll take care of the rest. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we have to understand something, even if it's just the glimpse of the future, the bright future that we have. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be missionaries, to be aliens, to be strangers just passing through this world. God, we know that you give us opportunities all the time. Lord, we want to buy up those opportunities. Help us to, be, to just discern when those opportunities are before us. And God, if there's any person in this room that has not accepted you as Savior, help that person to see clearly that without Jesus, the judgment of God will fall on them. Now, He doesn't want that to happen. And He's provided 
the way. Lord, I pray if there's any person like that, your word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I pray that they will call out to your name right now. For those of us who do know you, help us to realize that time is short and to trust and obey you in whatever you tell us to do. We love you. Thank you for dying on the cross to save us from our sins. Thank you for the abundant life and the hope of heaven. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship together. This is your opportunity to respond to the gospel. Come pray at this altar to talk to someone about your salvation, about baptism, about becoming a part of the church family. Let's do that right now. Come every soul right there. have a great afternoon and as soon as Amy gets to me and we get to the end of the aisle you will be dismissed